Chapter Eighteen of the Life and Adventures of Sir Lancelot Greaves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. The Life and Adventures of Sir Lancelot Greaves by Tobias Smollett. Chapter Eighteen in which the rays of chivalry shine with renovated lustre. Our hero little dreamed that he had a formidable rival in the person of the knight, who arrived about eleven at the sign of the St. George, and, by the noise he made, gave intimation of his importance. This was no other than Squire Sycamore, who, having received advice that Miss Aurelia Darnell had eloped from the place of her retreat, immediately took the field in quest of that lovely fugitive hoping that should he have the good fortune to find her in present distress his good offices would not be rejected he had followed the chase so close that immediately after our adventurer's departure he alighted at the inn from whence aurelia had been conveyed and there he learned the particulars which we have related above Mr. Sycamore had a great deal of the childish romantic in his disposition, and, in the course of his amours, is said to have always taken more pleasure in the pursuit than in the final possession. He had heard of Sir Lancelot's extravagance, by which he was in some measure infected, and he dropped an insinuation that he could eclipse his rival, even in his own lunatic sphere this hint was not lost upon his companion counsellor and buffoon the facetious davy dawdle who had some humour and a great deal of mischief in his composition he looked upon his patron as a fool and his patron knew him to be both knave and fool yet the two characters suited each other so well that they could hardly exist asunder davy was an artful sycophant but he did not flatter in the usual way. On the contrary, he behaved en cavalier, and treated Sycamore, on whose bounty subsisted, with the most sarcastic familiarity. Nevertheless, he seasoned his freedom with certain qualifying ingredients, that subdued the bitterness of it, and was now become so necessary to the squire, that he had no idea of enjoyment, with which Dawdle was not somehow or other connected there had been a warm dispute betwixt them about the scheme of contesting the prize with sir lancelot in the lists of chivalry sycamore had insinuated that if he had a mind to play the fool he could wear armour wield a lance and manage a charger as well as sir lancelot greaves dawdle snatching the hint i had some time ago said he contrived a scheme for you which I was afraid you had not address enough to execute. It would be no difficult matter, in imitation of the bachelor, Samson Carrasco, to go in quest of Greaves as a knight-errant, defy him as a rival, and establish a compact by which the vanquished should obey the injunctions of the victor. "'That is my very idea!' cried Sycamore. "'Your idea?' replied the other had you ever an idea of your own conception thus the dispute began and was maintained with great vehemence until other arguments failing the squire offered to lay a wager of twenty guineas to this proposal dawdle answered by the interjection pish which inflamed sycamore to a repetition of the defiance you are in the right said dawdle to you such an argument as you know is by me unanswerable a wager of twenty guineas will at any time overthrow and confute all the logic of the most able syllogist who has not got a shilling in his pocket sycamore looked very grave at this declaration and after a short pause said i wonder dawdle what do you do with all your money i am surprised you should give yourself that trouble i never ask what you do with yours 
you have no occasion to ask you know pretty well how it goes what do you upbraid me with your favours tis mighty well sycamore nay dawdle i did not intend to affront sounds affront what d'ye mean i'll assure you davy you don't know me if you think i could be so ungenerous as to a to a i always thought whatever faults or foibles you might have sycamore that you was not deficient in generosity though to be sure it is often very absurdly displayed ay that's one of my greatest foibles i can't refuse even a scoundrel when i think he is in want here dawdle take that note not i sir what d'ye mean what right have i to your notes nay but dawdle come by no means it looks like the abuse of good nature all the world knows you're good natured to a fault come dear davy you shall you must oblige me thus urged dawdle accepted the bank-note with great reluctance and restored the idea to the right owner a suit of armour being brought from the garret or armoury of his ancestors he gave orders for having the pieces scoured and furbished up and his heart dilated with joy when he reflected upon the superb figure he should make when cased in complete steel and armed at all points for the combat when he was fitted with the other parts dawdle insisted on buckling on his helmet which weighed fifteen pounds and the headpiece being adjusted made such a clatter about his ears with a cudgel that his eyes had almost started from their sockets his voice was lost within the visor and his friend affected not to understand his meaning when he made signs with his gauntlets and endeavoured to close with him that he might wrest the cudgel from his hand at length he desisted saying i'll warrant the helmet sound by its ringing and taking it off found the squire in a cold sweat he would have achieved his first exploit on the spot had his strength permitted him to assault dawdle but what with want of air and the discipline he had undergone he had well nigh swooned away and before he retrieved the use of his members he was appeased by the apologies of his companion who protested he meant nothing more than to try if the helmet was free of cracks and whether or not it would prove a good protection for the head it covered his excuses were accepted the armour was packed up and next morning mr sycamore set out from his own house accompanied by dawdle who undertook to perform the part of his squire at the approaching combat he was also attended by a servant on horseback who had charge of the armour and another who blowed the trumpet they no sooner understood that our hero was housed at the george than the trumpeter sounded a charge which alarmed sir lancelot and his company and disturbed honest captain crow in the middle of his first sleep their next step was to pen a challenge which when the stranger departed was by the trumpeter delivered with great ceremony into the hands of sir lancelot who read it in these words to the knight crescent greeting whereas i am informed you have the presumption to lay claim to the heart of the peerless aurelia darnell i give you notice that i can admit no rivalship in the affection of that paragon of beauty and i expect that you will either resign your pretensions or make it appear in single combat according to the law of arms and the institutions of chivalry that you are worthy to dispute her favour with him of the griffin polydor our adventurer was not a little surprised at this address which however he pocketed in silence and began to reflect not without mortification that he was treated as a lunatic by some person who wanted to amuse himself with the infirmities of his fellow-creatures mr thomas clark 
who saw the ceremony with which the letter was delivered, and the emotions with which it was read, hied him to the kitchen for intelligence, and there learned that the stranger was Squire Sycamore. He forthwith comprehended the nature of the billet, and, in the apprehension that bloodshed would ensue, resolved to alarm his uncle that he might assist in keeping the peace. He accordingly entered the apartment of the captain, who had been waked by the trumpet, and now peevishly asked the meaning of that damned piping, as if all hands were called upon deck. Clark, having imparted what he knew of the transaction, together with his own conjectures, the captain said, he did not suppose as how they would engage by candlelight, and that, for his own part, he should turn out in the larboard watch, long enough before any signals could be hove out for forming the line. With this assurance, the lawyer retired to his nest, where he did not fail to dream of Mrs. Dolly Cowslip, while Sir Lancelot passed the night awake, in ruminating on the strange challenge he had received. He had got notice that the sender was Mr. Sycamore, and hesitated with himself whether he should not punish him for his impertinence. But when he reflected on the nature of the dispute, and the serious consequences it might produce, he resolved to decline the combat as a trial of right and merit founded upon absurdity. Even in his maddest hours, he never adopted those maxims of knight-errantry which related to challenges. He always perceived the folly and wickedness of defying a man to mortal fight because he did not like the colour of his beard or the complexion of his mistress, or of deciding by homicide whether he or his rival deserved the preference when it was the lady's prerogative to determine which should be the happy lover. It was his opinion that chivalry was an useful institution while confined to its original purposes of protecting the innocent, assisting the friendless, and bringing the guilty to condign punishment. But he could not conceive how these laws should be answered by violating every suggestion of reason and every precept of humanity. Captain Crow did not examine the matter so philosophically. He took it for granted that in the morning the two knights would come to action, and slept sound upon that supposition. But he rose before it was day, resolved to be somehow concerned in the fray, and understanding that the stranger had a companion, set him down immediately for his own antagonist. So impatient was he to establish this secondary contest, that by daybreak he entered the chamber of Dordle, to which he was directed by the waiter, and roused him with a hilloa, that might have been heard at the distance of half a league. Dordle, startled by this terrific sound, sprung out of bed, and stood upright on the floor, before he opened his eyes upon the object by which he had been so dreadfully alarmed. But when he beheld the head of Crow, so swelled and swathed, so livid, hideous, and grisly, with a broadsword by his side, and a case of pistols in his girdle, he believed it was the apparition of some murdered man. His hair bristled up, his teeth chattered, and his knees knocked. He would have prayed, but his tongue denied its office. Crow, seeing his perturbation, Mayhap, friend, said he, you take me for a buccaneer, but I am no such person. My name is Captain Crow. I come not for your silver, nor your gold your rigging, nor your stowage. But earing as how your friend intends to bring my friend Sir Lancelot Greaves to action, do you see? I desire in the way of friendship that, while they are engaged, you and I, as their seconds, may lie board and board for a few glasses to divert one another, do you see? Dordle, hearing this request, began to retrieve his faculties and throwing himself into the attitude of Hamlet when the ghost appears, exclaimed in theatrical accent, "'Angels and ministers of grace defend us! Art thou a spirit of grace or goblin damned?' 
as he seemed to bend his eye on vacancy the captain began to think that he really saw something preternatural and stared wildly round then addressing himself to the terrified dawdle damned said he for what should i be damned if you are afraid of goblins brother put your trust in the lord and he'll prove a sheet anchor to you the other having by this time recollected himself perfectly continued notwithstanding to spout tragedy and in the words of macbeth pronounced what man dare i dare approach thou like the rugged russian bear the armed rhinoceros or hyrcanian tiger take any shape but that and my firm nerves shall never tremble where names jack cried the impatient mariner if so be as how you'll bear a hand and rig yourself and take a short trip with me into the offing we'll overhaul this here affair in the turning of a capstan at this juncture they were joined by mr sycamore in his nightgown and slippers disturbed by crow's first salute he sprung up and now expressed no small astonishment at first sight of the novice's countenance after having gazed alternately at him and dawdle who have we got here said he raw head and bloody bones when his friend slipping on his clothes gave him to understand that this was a friend of sir lancelot greaves and explained the purport of his errand he treated him with more civility he assured him that he should have the pleasure to break a spear with mr dawdle and signified his surprise that sir lancelot had made no answer to his letter it being by this time clear daylight and crow extremely interested in this affair he broke without ceremony into the knight's chamber and told him abruptly that the enemy had brought to and waited for his coming up in order to begin the action i've hailed his consort said he a shambling chattering fellow he took me first for a hobgoblin then called me names a tiger a rhinos ross and a persian bear but egad if i come athwart him i'll make him look like the bear and ragged staff before we part i will this intimation was not received with that alacrity which the captain expected to find in our adventurer who told him in a peremptory tone that he had no design to come to action and desired to be left to his repose crow forthwith retired crestfallen and muttered something which was never distinctly heard about eight in the morning mr dawdle brought him a formal message from the knight of the griffin desiring he would appoint the lists and give security of the field to which request he made answer in a very composed and solemn accent if the person who sent you thinks i have injured him let him without disguise or any such ridiculous ceremony explain the nature of the wrong and then i shall give such satisfaction as may suit my conscience and my character if he hath bestowed his affection upon any particular object and looks upon me as a favourite rival i shall not wrong the lady so much as to take any step that may prejudice her choice especially a step that contradicts my own reason as much as it would outrage the laws of my country if he who calls himself knight of the griffin is really desirous of treading in the paths of true chivalry he will not want opportunities of signalising his valour in the cause of virtue should he notwithstanding this declaration offer violence to me in the course of my occasions he will always find me in a posture of defence or should he persist in repeating his importunities i shall without ceremony chastise the messenger his declining the combat was interpreted into fear by mr sycamore who now became more insolent and ferocious on the supposition of our knight's timidity sir lancelot meanwhile went to breakfast with his friends and having put on his armour ordered the horses to be brought forth then he paid the bill 
and walking deliberately to the gate in presence of squire sycamore and his attendants vaulted at one spring into the saddle of bronza Marte, whose neighing and curvetting proclaimed the joy he felt in being mounted by his accomplished master though the knight of the griffin did not think proper to insult his rival personally his friend dawdle did not fail to crack some jokes on the figure and horsemanship of crow who again declared he should be glad to fall in with him upon the voyage nor did mr clark's black patch and rueful countenance pass unnoticed and unridiculed as for timothy crabshaw he beheld his brother squire with the contempt of a veteran and gilbert paid him his compliments with his heels at parting but when our adventurer and his retinue were clear of the inn mr sycamore ordered his trumpeter to sound a retreat by way of triumph over his antagonist perhaps he would have contented himself with this kind of victory had not dawdle further inflamed his envy and ambition by launching out in praise of sir lancelot he observed that his countenance was open and manly his joints strong knit and his form unexceptionable that he trod like hercules and vaulted into the saddle like a winged mercury nay he even hinted it was lucky for sycamore that the knight of the crescent happened to be so pacifically disposed his patron sickened at these praises and took fire at the last observation he affected to undervalue personal beauty though the opinion of the world had been favourable to himself in that particular he said he was at least two inches taller than greaves and as to shape and air he would make no comparisons but with respect to riding he was sure he had a better seat than sir lancelot and would wager five hundred to fifty guineas that he would unhorse him at the first encounter there is no occasion for laying wagers replied mr dawdle the doubt may be determined in half an hour sir lancelot is not a man to avoid you at full gallop sycamore after some hesitation declared he would follow and provoke him to battle on condition that dawdle would engage crow and this condition was accepted for though davy had no stomach to the trial he could not readily find an excuse for declining it besides he had discovered the captain to be a very bad horseman and resolved to eke out his own scanty valour with a border of ingenuity the servants were immediately ordered to unpack the armour and in a little time mr sycamore made a very formidable appearance but the scene that followed is too important to be huddled in at the end of a chapter and therefore we shall reserve it for a more conspicuous place in these memoirs End of chapter 18chapter 19 of the life and adventures of sir lancelot greaves this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jennifer painter the life and adventures of sir lancelot greaves by tobias smollett chapter 19 containing the achievements of the knights of the griffin and crescent mr sycamore alias the knight of the griffin so denominated from a griffin painted on his shield being armed at all points and his friend dawdle provided with a certain implement which he flattered himself would ensure a victory over the novice crow they set out from the george with their attendants in all the elevation of hope and pranced along the highway that led towards london that being the road which our adventurer pursued as they were extremely well mounted and proceeded at a round pace they in less than two hours came up with sir lancelot and his company and sycamore sent another formal defiance to the knight by his trumpeter dawdle having for good reasons declined that office our adventurer hearing himself thus addressed and seeing his rival who had passed him posted to obstruct his progress armed cap a pie 
with his lance in the rest, determined to give the satisfaction that was required, and desired that the regulations of the combat might be established. The knight of the griffin proposed that the vanquished party should resign all pretensions to Miss Aurelia Darnell in favour of the victor, that, while the principals were engaged, his friend Dordle should run a tilt with Captain Crow, that Squire Crabshaw and Mr. Sycamore's servant should keep themselves in readiness to assist their respective masters occasionally, according to the law of arms, and that Mr. Clark should observe the motions of the trumpeter whose province was to sound the charge to battle. Our knight agreed to these regulations, notwithstanding the earnest and pathetic remonstrances of the young lawyer, who, with tears in his eyes, conjured all the combatants in their turns to refrain from an action that might be attended with bloodshed and murder, and was contrary to the laws both of God and man. In vain he endeavoured to move them by tears and entreaties, by threatening them with prosecutions in this world, and pains and penalties in the next. They persisted in their resolution, and his uncle would have begun hostilities on his carcass had he not been prevented by Sir Lancelot, who exhorted Clark to retire from the field, that he might not be involved in the consequences of the combat. He relished this advice so well, that he had actually moved off to some distance, but his apprehensions and concern for his friends, cooperating with an insatiable curiosity, detained him in sight of the engagement. The two knights, having fairly divided the ground, and the same precautions being taken by the seconds on another part of the field, Sycamore began to be invaded with some scruples, which were probably engendered by the martial appearance and well-known character of his antagonist. The confidence which he derived from the reluctance of Sir Lancelot now vanished, because it plainly appeared that the knight's backwardness was not owing to personal timidity, and he foresaw that the prosecution of this joke might be attended with very serious consequences to his own life and reputation. He therefore desired a parley, in which he observed his affection for Miss Darnell was of such a delicate nature that should the discomfiture of his rival contribute to make her unhappy, his victory must render him the most miserable wretch upon earth. He proposed, therefore, that her sentiments and choice should be ascertained before they proceeded to extremity. Sir Lancelot declared that he was much more afraid of combating Aurelia's inclination than of opposing the knight of the griffin in arms, and that if he had the least reason to think Mr. Sycamore, or any other person, was distinguished by her preference, he would instantly give up his suit as desperate. At the same time he observed that Sycamore had proceeded too far to retract, that he had insulted a gentleman, and not only challenged, but even pursued him, and blocked up his passage in the public highway, outrages which he, Sir Lancelot, would not suffer to pass unpunished. Accordingly, he insisted on the combat, on pain of treating Sycamore as a craven and a recreant. This declaration was reinforced by Dordle, who told him that should he now decline the engagement, all the world would look upon him as an infamous poltroon. These two observations gave a necessary fillip to the courage of the challenger. The parties took their stations. The trumpet sounded to charge, and the combatants began their career with great impetuosity. Whether the gleam of Sir Lancelot's arms affrighted Mr. Sycamore's steed, or some other object had an unlucky effect on his eyesight, certain it is he started at about midway, and gave his rider such a violent shake as discomposed his attitude and disabled him from using his lance to the best advantage. Had our hero continued his career, with his lance couched, in all probability Sycamore's armour would have proved but a bad defence to his carcass. But Sir Lancelot, perceiving his rival's spear unrested, had just time to throw up the point of his own, when the two horses closed with such a shock that, 
sycamore already wavering in the saddle was overthrown and his armour crashed around him as he fell the victor seeing him lie without motion alighted immediately and began to unbuckle his helmet in which office he was assisted by the trumpeter when the headpiece was removed the hapless knight of the griffin appeared in the pale livery of death though he was only in a swoon from which he soon recovered by the effect of the fresh air and the aspersion of cold water brought from a small pool in the neighbourhood when he recognised his conqueror doing the offices of humanity about his person he closed his eyes from vexation told sir lancelot that his was the fortune of the day though he himself owed his mischance to the fault of his own horse and observed that this ridiculous affair would not have happened but for the mischievous instigation of that scoundrel dawdle on whose ribs he threatened to revenge this mishap perhaps captain crow might have saved him the trouble had the wag honourably adhered to the institutions of chivalry in his conflict with our novice but on this occasion his ingenuity was more commendable than his courage he had provided at the inn a blown bladder in which several smooth pebbles were enclosed and this he slyly fixed on the head of his pole and this he slyly fixed on the head of his pole when the captain obeyed the signal of battle instead of bearing the brunt of the encounter he turned out of the straight line so as to avoid the lance of his antagonist and rattled his bladder with such effect that crow's horse pricking up his ears took to his heels and fled across some ploughed land with such precipitation that the rider was obliged to quit his spear and lay fast hold on the mane that he might not be thrown out of the saddle dawdle who was much better mounted seeing his condition rode up to the unfortunate novice and belaboured his shoulders without fear of retaliation mr clark seeing his kinsman so roughly handled forgot his fears and flew to his assistance but before he came up the aggressor had retired and now perceiving that fortune had declared against his friend and patron very honourably abandoned him in his distress and went off at full speed for london nor was timothy crabshaw without his share in the noble achievements of this propitious day he had by this time imbibed such a tincture of errantry that he firmly believed himself and his master equally invincible and this belief operating upon a perverse disposition rendered him as quarrelsome in his sphere as his master was mild and forbearing as he sat on horseback in the place assigned to him and sycamore's lackey he managed gilbert in such a manner as to invade with his heels the posteriors of the other's horse and this insult produced some altercation which ended in mutual assault the footman handled the butt end of his horsewhip with great dexterity about the head of crabshaw who declared afterwards that it sung and simmered like a kettle of codfish but the squire who understood the nature of long lashes as having been a carter from his infancy found means to twine his thong about the neck of his antagonist and pull him off his horse half strangled at the very instant his master was thrown by sir lancelot greaves having thus obtained the victory he did not much regard the punctilious of chivalry but taking it for granted he had a right to make the most of his advantage resolved to carry off the spolia opima alighting with great agility brother cried he i think as all yours been butcher's horse and don't carry calves well i's make you know your churning days i will what you look as if you were crowd trodden you do now you shall pay the score that you have been running on my pate you shall brother so saying he rifled his pockets stripped him of his hat and coat and took possession of his master's portmanteau but he did not long enjoy his plunder for the lackey complaining to sir lancelot of his having been despoiled the knight commanded his squire to refund 
not without menaces of subjecting him to the severest chastisement for his injustice and rapacity. Timothy represented, with great vehemence, that he had won the spoils in fair battle, at the expense of his head and shoulders, which he immediately uncovered, to prove his allegation. But his remonstrance having no effect upon his master, "'Wones!' cried he, "'as I mun gie thee back the pig, "'I's gie thee back the poke also. "'I'm a drubbin still in thy debt.' With these words he made a most furious attack upon the plaintiff with his horsewhip, and before the knight could interpose, repaid the lackey with interest. As an appurtenance to Sycamore and Dawdle, he ran the risk of another assault from the novice crow, who was so transported with rage at the disagreeable trick which had been played upon him by his fugitive antagonist, that he could not for some time pronounce an articulate sound, but a few broken interjections the meaning of which could not be ascertained. Snatching up his pole, he ran towards the place where Mr. Sycamore sat on the ground, supported by the trumpeter, and would have finished what our adventurer had left undone, if the knight of the crescent, with admirable dexterity, had not warded off the blow which he aimed at the knight of the griffin, and signified his displeasure in a resolute tone. Then he collared the lackey, who was just disengaged from the chastising hand of Crabshaw, and swinging his lance with his other hand, encountered the squire's ribs by accident. Timothy was not slow in returning the salutation with the weapon which he still wielded. Mr. Clark, running up to the assistance of his uncle, was opposed by the lackey, who seemed extremely desirous of seeing the enemy revenge his quarrel by falling foul of one another. Clark, thus impeded, commenced hostilities against the footman, while Crow grappled with Crabshaw. A battle royal ensued, and was maintained with great vigour, and some bloodshed on all sides, until the authority of Sir Lancelot, reinforced by some weighty remonstrances applied to the squire, put an end to the conflict. Crabshaw immediately desisted, and ran roaring to communicate his grievances to Gilbert, who seemed to sympathise very little with his distress. The lackey took to his heels. Mr. Clark wiped his bloody nose, declaring he had a good mind to put the aggressor in the Crown office, and Captain Crow continued to ejaculate unconnected oaths, which, however, seemed to imply that he was almost sick of his new profession. Doubt me my eyes, if you call this, start me timbers, brother! Look, did you see, a lousy, lubberly, cowardly son of a... Among the breakers, do you see, lost my steerage way. Split my binnacle, fall away. Oh, d all arrantry, give me a tight vessel, do you see, brother? Maybe you mayn't snatch my sea-room and a spanking gale. Odds heart, I'll hold a old years, smite me limbs. It don't signify talking. Our hero consoled the novice for his disaster by observing that if he had got some blows, he had lost no honour. At the same time, he observed that it was very difficult, if not impossible, for a man to succeed in the paths of chivalry, who had passed the better part of his days in other occupations, and hinted that, as the cause which had engaged him in this way of life no longer existed, he was determined to relinquish a profession which, in a peculiar manner, exposed him to the most disagreeable incidents. Crow chewed the cud upon this insinuation, while the other personages of the drama were employed in catching the horses, which had given their riders the slip. As for Mr. Sycamore, he was so bruised by his fall that it was necessary to procure a litter for conveying him to the next town, and the servant was dispatched for this convenience, Sir Lancelot staying with him until it arrived. When he was safely deposited in the carriage, our hero took leave of him in these terms. I shall not insist upon your submitting to the terms you yourself proposed before this rencontre. I give you free leave to use all your advantages, in an honourable way, for promoting your suit with the young lady of whom you profess yourself enamoured. 
should you have recourse to sinister practices you will find sir lancelot greaves ready to demand an account of your conduct not in the character of a lunatic knight-errant but as a plain english gentleman jealous of his honour and resolute in his purpose to this address mr sycamore made no reply but with a sullen aspect ordered the carriage to proceed and it moved accordingly to the right our hero's road to london lying in the other direction sir lancelot having already exchanged his armour for a riding coat hat and boots and crow parting with his skull-cap and leathern jerkin regained in some respects the appearance of a human creature thus metamorphosed they pursued their way in an easy pace mr clark endeavouring to amuse them with a learned dissertation on the law tending to demonstrate that mr sycamore was by his behaviour on that day liable to three different actions besides a commission of lunacy and that dawdle might be prosecuted for having practised subtle craft to the annoyance of his uncle over and above an action for assault and battery because for why the said crow having run away as might be easily proved before any blows were given the said dawdle by pursuing him even out of the high road putting him in fear and committing battery on his body became to all intents and purposes the aggressor and an indictment would lie in banco regis the captain's pride was so shocked at these observations that he exclaimed with equal rage and impatience you lie you dog in bilkham regis you lie i say you lover i did not run away nor was i in fear d'ye see it was my son of a bitch of a horse that would not obey the helm d'ye see whereby i couldn't use my metal d'ye see as for the matter of fear you and fear may kiss my so don't go and heave your stink pots at my character d'ye see or a gad i'll trim thee fore and aft with a i will tom protested he meant nothing but a little speculation and crow was appeased in the evening they reached the town of bugden without any further adventure and passed the night in great tranquillity next morning even after the horses were ordered to be saddled mr clark without ceremony entered the apartment of sir lancelot leading in a female who proved to be the identical mrs dolly cowslip this young lady advancing to the knight cried oh sir lancelot my dear lady my dear lady but was hindered from proceeding by a flood of tears which the tender-hearted lawyer mingled with a plentiful shower of sympathy our adventurer starting at this exclamation oh heavens cried he where is my aurelia speak where did you leave that jewel of my soul answer me in a moment i am all terror and impatience dolly having recollected herself told him that mr darnell had lodged his niece in the new buildings by mayfair that on the second night after their arrival a very warm expostulation had passed between aurelia and her uncle who next morning dismissed dolly without permitting her to take leave of her mistress and that same day moved to another part of the town as she afterwards learned of the landlady though she could not inform her whither they were gone that when she was turned away john clump one of the footmen who pretended to have a kindness for her had faithfully promised to call upon her and let her know what passed in the family but as he did not keep his word and she was an utter stranger in london without friends or settlement she had resolved to return to her mother and travelled so far on foot since yesterday morning our knight who had expected the most dismal tidings from her lamentable preamble was pleased to find his presaging fears disappointed though he was far from being satisfied with the dismission of dolly from whose attachment to his interest joined to her influence over mr clump he had hoped to reap such intelligence as would guide him to the haven of his desires 
After a minute's reflection, he saw it would be expedient to carry back Mrs. Cowslip and lodge her at the place where Mr. Clump had promised to visit her with intelligence, for, in all probability, it was not for want of inclination that he had not kept his promise. Dolly did not express any aversion to the scheme of returning to London, where she hoped once more to rejoin her dear lady, to whom by this time she was attached by the strongest ties of affection, and her inclination in this respect was assisted by the consideration of having the company of the young lawyer, who, it plainly appeared, had made strange havoc in her heart, though it must be owned, for the honour of this blooming damsel, that her thoughts had never once deviated from the paths of innocence and virtue. The more Sir Lancelot surveyed this agreeable maiden, the more he felt himself disposed to take care of her fortune. And from this day he began to ruminate on a scheme which was afterwards consummated in her favour. In the meantime, he laid injunctions on Mr. Clark to conduct his addresses to Mrs. Cowslip, according to the rules of honour and decorum, as he valued his countenance and friendship. His next step was to procure a saddle-horse for Dolly, who preferred this to any other sort of carriage, and thereby gratified the wish of her admirer, who longed to see her on horseback in her green Joseph. The armour, including the accoutrements of the novice and the squire, were left in the care of the innkeeper, and Tibithy Crabshaw was so metamorphosed by a plain livery frock, that even Gilbert with difficulty recognised his person. As for the novice crow, his head had almost resumed its natural dimensions, but then his whole face was so covered with a livid suffusion, his nose appeared so flat, and his lips so tumefied, that he might well have passed for a Caffre or Ethiopian. Every circumstance being now adjusted, they departed from Bugden in a regular cavalcade, dined at Hatfield, and in the evening arrived at the Bull and Gate Inn in Hoburn, where they established their quarters for the night. End of chapter 19「Chapter 20 of the Life and Adventures of Sir Lancelot Greaves – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter – The Life and Adventures of Sir Lancelot Greaves by Tobias Smollett – Chapter 20 in which our hero descends into the mansion of the damned. The first step which Sir Lancelot took in the morning that succeeded his arrival in London was to settle Mrs. Dolly Cowslip in lodgings at the house where John Clump had promised to visit her, as he did not doubt that, though the visit was delayed, it would some time or other be performed, and in that case he might obtain some intelligence of Aurelia. Mr. Thomas Clark was permitted to take up his habitation in the same house, on his earnestly desiring he might be entrusted with the office of conveying information and instruction between Dolly and our adventurer. The knight himself resolved to live retired, until he should receive some tidings relating to Miss Darnell that should influence his conduct, but he proposed to frequent places of public resort incognito, that he might have some chance of meeting by accident with the mistress of his heart. Taking it for granted that the oddities of Crow would help to amuse him in his hours of solitude and disappointment, he invited that original to be his guest at a small house, which he determined to hire ready furnished, in the neighbourhood of Golden Square. The captain thanked him for his courtesy, and frankly embraced his offer, though he did not much approve of the knight's choice in point of situation. He said he would recommend him to a special good upper deck hard by St. Catherine's in Wapping, where he would be delighted with the prospect of the street forwards, well frequented by passengers, carts, drays, and other carriages, and having backwards an agreeable view of Alderman Parsons' great brew-house, with two hundred hogs feeding almost under the window. 
as a further inducement he mentioned the vicinity of the tower guns which would regale his hearing on days of salutation nor did he forget the sweet sound of mooring and unmooring ships in the river and the pleasing objects on the other side of the thames displayed in the oozy docks and cabbage gardens of rotherhithe sir lancelot was not insensible to the beauties of this landscape but his pursuit lying another way he contented himself with a less enchanting situation and crow accompanied him out of pure friendship at night mr clark arrived at our hero's house with tidings that were by no means agreeable he told him that clump had left a letter for dolly informing her that his master squire darnell was to set out early in the morning for yorkshire but he could give no account of her lady who had the day before been conveyed he knew not whither in a hackney coach attended by her uncle and an ill-looking fellow who had much the appearance of a bailiff or turnkey so that he feared she was in trouble sir lancelot was deeply affected by this intimation his apprehension was even roused by a suspicion that a man of darnell's violent temper and unprincipled heart might have practised upon the life of his lovely niece but upon recollection he could not suppose that he had recourse to such infamous expedients knowing as he did that an account of her would be demanded at his hands and that it would be easily proved he had conveyed her from the lodging in which she resided his first fears now gave way to another suggestion that anthony in order to intimidate her into a compliance with his proposals had trumped up a spurious claim against her and by virtue of a writ confined her in some prison or sponging house possessed with this idea he desired mr clark to search the sheriff's office in the morning that he might know whether any such writ had been granted and he himself resolved to make a tour of the great prisons belonging to the metropolis to inquire if perchance she might not be confined under a borrowed name finally he determined if possible to apprise her of his place of abode by a paragraph in all the daily papers signifying that sir lancelot greaves had arrived at his house near golden square all these resolutions were punctually executed no such writ had been taken out in the sheriff's office and therefore our hero set out on his jail expedition accompanied by mr clark who had contracted some acquaintance with the commanding officers in these garrisons in the course of his clerkship and practice as an attorney the first day they spent in prosecuting their inquiry through the gatehouse fleet and marshalsea the next day they allotted to the king's bench where they understood there was a great variety of prisoners there they proposed to make a minute scrutiny by the help of mr norton the deputy marshal who was mr clark's intimate friend and had nothing at all of the jailer either in his appearance or in his disposition which was remarkably humane and benevolent towards all his fellow creatures the knight having bespoke dinner at a tavern in the borough was together with captain crow conducted to the prison of the king's bench which is situated in st george's fields about a mile from the end of westminster bridge and appears like a neat little regular town consisting of one street surrounded by a very high wall including an open piece of ground which may be termed a garden where the prisoners take the air and amuse themselves with a variety of diversions except the entrance where the turnkeys keep watch and ward there is nothing in the place that looks like a jail or bears the least colour of restraint the street is crowded with passengers tradesmen of all kinds here exercise their different professions hawkers of all sorts are admitted to call and vend their wares as in any open street of london here are butchers stands chandlers shops a surgery a tap-house well frequented and a public kitchen 
in which provisions are dressed for all the prisoners gratis at the expense of the publican here the voice of misery never complains and indeed little else is to be heard but the sounds of mirth and jollity at the farther end of the street on the right hand is a little paved court leading to a separate building consisting of twelve large apartments called state rooms well furnished and fitted up for the reception of the better sort of crown prisoners and on the other side of the street facing a separate division of ground called the common side is a range of rooms occupied by prisoners of the lowest order who share the profits of a begging box and are maintained by this practice and some established funds of charity we ought also to observe that the jail is provided with a neat chapel in which a clergyman in consideration of a certain salary performs divine service every sunday our adventurer having searched the books and perused the description of all the female prisoners who had been for some weeks admitted into the jail obtained not the least intelligence of his concealed charmer but resolved to alleviate his disappointment by the gratification of his curiosity under the auspices of mr norton he made a tour of the prison and in particular visited the kitchen where he saw a number of spits loaded with a variety of provision consisting of butcher's meat poultry and game he could not help expressing his astonishment with uplifted hands and congratulating himself in secret upon his being a member of that community which had provided such a comfortable asylum for the unfortunate his ejaculation was interrupted by a tumultuous noise in the street and mr norton declaring he was sent for to the lodge consigned our hero to the care of one mr felton a prisoner of a very decent appearance who paid his compliments with a good grace and invited the company to repose themselves in his apartment which was large commodious and well furnished when sir launcelot asked the cause of that uproar he told him that it was the prelude to a boxing match between two of the prisoners to be decided in the ground or garden of the place captain crow expressing an eager curiosity to see the battle mr felton assured him there would be no sport as the combatants were both reckoned dunghills but in half an hour said he there will be a battle of some consequence between two of the demagogues of the place dr crabclaw and mr tapley the first a physician and the other a brewer you must know gentlemen that this microcosm or republic in miniature is like the great world split into factions crabclaw is the leader of one party and the other is headed by tapley both are men of warm and impetuous tempers and their intrigues have embroiled the whole place insomuch that it was dangerous to walk the street on account of the continual skirmishes of their partisans at length some of the more sedate inhabitants having met and deliberated upon some remedy for these growing disorders proposed that the dispute should be at once decided by single combat between the two chiefs who readily agreed to the proposal the match was accordingly made for five guineas and this very day and hour appointed for the trial on which considerable sums of money are depending as for mr norton it is not proper that he should be present or seem to countenance such violent proceedings which however it is necessary to connive at as convenient vents for the evaporation of those humours which being confined might accumulate and break out with greater fury in conspiracy and rebellion the knight owned he could not conceive by what means such a number of licentious people amounting with their dependents to above five hundred were restrained within the bounds of any tolerable discipline or prevented from making their escape which they might at any time accomplish either by stealth or open violence as it could not be supposed that one or two turnkeys 
continually employed in opening and shutting the door could resist the efforts of a whole multitude your wonder good sir said mr felton will vanish when you consider it is hardly possible that the multitude should cooperate in the execution of such a scheme and that the keeper perfectly well understands the maxim divide et impera many prisoners are restrained by the dictates of gratitude towards the deputy marshal whose friendship and good offices they have experienced some no doubt are actuated by motives of discretion one party is an effectual check upon the other and i am firmly persuaded that there are not ten prisoners within the place that would make their escape if the doors were laid open this is a step which no man would take unless his fortune was altogether desperate because it would oblige him to leave his country for life and expose him to the most imminent risk of being retaken and treated with the utmost severity the majority of the prisoners live in the most lively hope of being released by the assistance of their friends the compassion of their creditors or the favour of the legislature some who are cut off from all these proposals are become naturalised to the place knowing they cannot subsist in any other situation i myself are one of these after having resigned all my effects for the benefit of my creditors i have been detained these nine years in prison because one person refuses to sign my certificate i have long outlived all my friends from whom i could expect the least countenance or favour i am grown old in confinement and lay my account with ending my days in jail as the mercy of the legislature in favour of insolvent debtors is never extended to uncertified bankrupts taken in execution by dint of industry and the most rigid economy i make shift to live independent in this retreat to this scene my faculty of subsisting as well as my body is peculiarly confined had i an opportunity to escape where should i go all my views of fortune have been long blasted i have no friends nor connections in the world i must therefore starve in some sequestered corner or be recaptivated and confined for ever to close prison deprived of the indulgences which i now enjoy here the conversation was broke off by another uproar which was the signal to battle between the doctor and his antagonist the company immediately adjourned to the field where the combatants were already undressed and the stakes deposited the doctor seemed of the middle age and middle stature active and alert with an atrabilious aspect and a mixture of rage and disdain expressed in his countenance the brewer was large raw-boned and round as a butt of beer but very fat unwieldy short-winded and phlegmatic our adventurer was not a little surprised when he beheld in the character of seconds a male and female stripped naked from the waist upwards the latter ranging on the side of the physician but the commencement of the battle prevented his demanding of his guide an explanation of this phenomenon the doctor retiring some paces backwards threw himself into the attitude of a battering ram and rushed upon his antagonist with great impetuosity foreseeing that should he have the good fortune to overturn him in the first assault it would not be an easy task to raise him up again and put him in a capacity of offence but the momentum of crab claw's head and the concomitant efforts of his knuckles had no effect upon the ribs of tapley who stood firm as the acroceronian promontory and stepping forward with his projected fist something smaller and softer than a sledge-hammer struck the physician to the ground in a trice however by the assistance of his female second he was on his legs again and grappling with his antagonist endeavoured to tip him a fall but instead of accomplishing his purpose he received a cross buttock and the brewer throwing himself upon him as he fell had well nigh smothered him on the spot the amazon flew to his assistance 
and Tapley showing no inclination to get up, she smote him on the temple till he roared. The male second, hastening to the relief of his principal, made application to the eyes of the female, which were immediately surrounded with black circles, and she returned the salute with a blow, which brought a double stream of blood from his nostrils, greeting him at the same time with the opprobrious appellation of a lousy sung of a b a combat more furious than the first would now have ensued had not felton interposed with an air of authority and insisted on the man's leaving the field an injunction which he forthwith obeyed saying well damn felton you are my friend and commander i'll obey your order but the b will be foul of me before we sleep then felton advancing to his opponent madam said he i am very sorry to see a lady of your rank and qualifications expose yourself in this manner for god's sake behave with a little more decorum if not for the sake of your own family at least for the credit of your sex in general hark ye felton said she decorum is founded upon a delicacy of sentiment and deportment which cannot consist with the disgraces of a jail and the miseries of indigence but i see the dispute is now terminated and the money is to be drank if you'll dine with us you shall be welcome if not you may die in your sobriety and he damned by this time the doctor had given out and allowed the brewer to be the better man yet he would not honour the festival with his presence but retired to his chamber exceedingly mortified at his defeat our hero was reconducted to mr felton's apartment where he sat some time without opening his mouth so astonished he was at what he had seen and heard i perceive sir said the prisoner you are surprised at the manner in which i accosted that unhappy woman and perhaps you will be more surprised when you hear that within these eighteen months she was actually a person of fashion and her opponent who by the by is her husband universally respected as a man of honour and a brave officer i am indeed cried our hero overwhelmed with amazement and concern as well as stimulated by an eager curiosity to know the fatal causes which have produced such a reverse of character and fortune but i will rein my curiosity till the afternoon if you will favour me with your company at a tavern in the neighbourhood where i have bespoke dinner a favour which i hope mr norton will have no objection to your granting as he himself is to be of the party the prisoner thanked him for his kind invitation and they adjourned immediately to the place taking up the deputy marshal in their passage through the lodge or entrance of the prison End of chapter 20「Chapter 21 of the Life and Adventures of Sir Lancelot Greaves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter the life and adventures of sir lancelot greaves by tobias smollett chapter twenty one containing further anecdotes relating to the children on wretchedness dinner being cheerfully discussed and our adventurer expressing an e eager desire to know the history of the male and female who had acted as squires or seconds to the champions of the king's bench felton gratified his curiosity to this effect all that i know of captain cluline previous to his commitment is that he was a commander of a sloop of war and bore the reputation of a gallant officer that he married the daughter of a rich merchant in the city of london against the inclination and without the knowledge of her father who renounced her for this act of disobedience that the captain consoled himself for the rigour of the parent with the possession of the lady who was not only remarkably beautiful in person but highly accomplished in her mind and amiable in her disposition 
such a few months ago were those two persons whom you saw acting in such a vulgar capacity when they first entered the prison they were undoubtedly the handsomest couple mine eyes ever beheld and their appearance won universal respect even from the most brutal inhabitants of the jail the captain having unwarily involved himself as a security for a man to whom he had lain under obligations became liable for a considerable sum and his own father-in-law being the sole creditor of the bankrupt took this opportunity of wreaking vengeance upon him for having espoused his daughter he watched an opportunity until the captain had actually stepped into the post-chaise with his lady for portsmouth where his ship lay and caused him to be arrested in the most public and shameful manner mrs clewline had liked to have sunk under the first transports of her grief and mortification but these subsiding she had recourse to personal solicitation she went with her only child in her arms a lovely boy to her father's door and being denied admittance kneeled down in the street imploring his compassion in the most pathetic strain but this hard-hearted citizen instead of recognising his child and taking the poor mourner to his bosom insulted her from the window with the most bitter reproach saying among other shocking expressions strumpet take yourself away with your brat otherwise i shall send for the beadle and have you to bridewell the unfortunate lady was cut to the heart by this usage and fainted in the street from whence she was conveyed to a public house by the charity of some passengers she afterwards attempted to soften the barbarity of her father by repeated letters and by interesting some of his friends to intercede with him in her behalf but all her endeavours proving ineffectual she accompanied her husband to the prison of the king's bench where she must have felt in the severest manner the fatal reverse of circumstance to which she was exposed the captain being disabled from going to sea was superseded and he saw all his hopes blasted in the midst of an active war at a time when he had the fairest prospects of fame and fortune he saw himself reduced to extreme poverty cooped up with the tender partner of his heart in a wretched hovel amidst the refuse of mankind and on the brink of wanting the common necessaries of life the mind of man is ever ingenious in finding resources he comforted his lady with vain hopes of having friends who would effect his deliverance and repeated assurances of this kind so long that he at length began to think they were not altogether void of foundation mrs clewline from a principle of duty recollected all her fortitude that she might not only bear her fate with patience but even contribute to alleviate the woes of her husband whom her affection had ruined she affected to believe the suggestions of his pretended hope she interchanged with him assurances of better fortune her appearance exhibited a calm while her heart was torn with anguish she assisted him in writing letters to former friends the last consolation of the wretched prisoner she delivered these letters with her own hand and underwent a thousand mortifying repulses the most shocking circumstances of which she concealed from her husband she performed all the menial offices in her own little family which was maintained by pawning her apparel and both the husband and wife in some measure sweetened their cares by prattling and toying with their charming little boy on whom they doted with an enthusiasm of fondness yet even this pleasure was mingled with the most tender and melancholy regret i have seen the mother hang over him with the most affecting expression of this kind in her aspect the tears contending with the smiles upon her countenance while she exclaimed alas my poor prisoner little did your mother once think she should be obliged to nurse you in a jail 
the captain's paternal love was dashed with impatience he would snatch up the boy in a transport of grief press him to his breast devour him as it were with kisses throw up his eyes to heaven in the most emphatic silence then convey the child hastily to his mother's arms pull his hat over his eyes stalk out into the common walk and finding himself alone break out into tears and lamentation ah little did this unhappy couple know what further griefs awaited them the smallpox broke out in the prison and poor tommy clewline was infected as the eruption appeared unfavourable you may conceive the consternation with which they were overwhelmed their distress was rendered inconceivable by indigence for by this time they were so destitute that they could neither pay for common attendance nor procure proper advice i did on that occasion what i thought my duty towards my fellow-creatures i wrote to a physician of my acquaintance who was humane enough to visit the poor little patient i engaged a careful woman prisoner as a nurse and mr norton supplied them with money and necessaries these helps were barely sufficient to preserve them from the horrors of despair when they saw their little darling panting under the rage of a loathsome pestilential malady during the excessive heat of the dog days and struggling for breath in the noxious atmosphere of a confined cabin where they scarce had room to turn on the most necessary occasions the eager curiosity with which the mother eyed the doctor's looks as often as he visited the boy the terror and trepidation of the father while he desired to know his opinion in a word the whole tenor of their distress baffled all description at length the physician for the sake of his own character was obliged to be explicit and returning with the captain to the common walk told him in my hearing that the child could not possibly recover this sentence seemed to have petrified the unfortunate parent who stood motionless and seemingly bereft of sense i led him to my apartment where he sat a full hour in that state of stupefaction then he began to groan hideously a shower of tears burst from his eyes he threw himself on the floor and uttered the most piteous lamentation that ever was heard meanwhile mrs norton being made acquainted with the doctor's prognostic visited mrs clewline and invited her to the lodge her prophetic fears immediately took the alarm what cried she starting up with a frantic wildness in her looks then our case is desperate i shall lose my dear tommy the poor prisoner will be released by the hand of heaven death will convey him to the cold grave the dying innocent hearing this exclamation pronounced these words tommy won't leave you my dear mamma if death comes to take tommy papa shall drive him away with his sword this address deprived the wretched mother of all resignation to the will of providence she tore her hair dashed herself on the pavement shrieked aloud and was carried off in a deplorable state of distraction that same evening the lovely babe expired and the father grew frantic he made an attempt on his own life and being with difficulty restrained his agitation sunk into a kind of sullen insensibility which seemed to absorb all sentiment and gradually vulgarized his faculty of thinking in order to dissipate the violence of his sorrow he continually shifted the scene from one company to another contracted abundance of low connections and drowned his cares in repeated intoxication the unhappy lady underwent a long series of hysterical fits and other complaints which seemed to have a fatal effect on her brain as well as constitution 
cordials were administered to keep up her spirits, and she found it necessary to protract the use of them to blunt the edge of grief by overwhelming reflection and remove the sense of uneasiness arising from a disorder in her stomach. In a word, she became a habitual dram drinker, and this practice exposed her to such communication as debauched her reason and perverted her sense of decorum and propriety. She and her husband gave a loose to vulgar excess, in which they were enabled to indulge by the charity and interest of some friends who obtained half pay for the captain. They are now metamorphosed into the shocking creatures you have seen, he into a riotous plebeian, and she into a ragged trull. They are both drunk every day, quarrel and fight one with another, and often insult their fellow prisoners. Yet they are not wholly abandoned by virtue and humanity. The captain is scrupulously honest in all his dealings, and pays off his debts punctually every quarter, as soon as he receives his half-pay. Every prisoner in distress is welcome to share his money while it lasts, and his wife never fails, while it is in her power, to relieve the wretched, so that their generosity, even in this miserable disguise, is universally respected by their neighbours. Sometimes the recollection of their former rank comes over them like a qualm, which they dispel with brandy, and then humorously rally one another on their mutual degeneracy. She often stops me in the walk, and pointing to the captain says, My husband, though he is become a blackguard jailbird, must be allowed to be a handsome fellow still. On the other hand, he will frequently desire me to take notice of his rib, as she chances to pass. Mind that draggle tail, drunken drab, he will say. What an antidote it is, yet, for all that, Felton, she was a fine woman when I married her. Poor Bess, I have been the ruin of her, that is certain, and deserve to be d for bringing her to this pass. Thus they accommodate themselves to each other's infirmities, and pass their time not without some taste of plebeian enjoyment but name their child, they never fail to burst into tears and still feel a return of the most poignant sorrow. Sir Lancelot Greaves did not hear this story unmoved. Tom Clark's cheeks were bedewed with the drops of sympathy, while, with much sobbing, he declared his opinion that an action should lie against the lady's father. Captain Crow having listened to the story with uncommon attention, expressed his concern that an honest seaman should be so taken in stays, but he imputed all his calamities to the wife. "'For why?' said he. "'A seafaring man may have a sweetheart in every port, but he should steer clear of a wife, as he would avoid a quicksand. "'You see, brother, how this here clue-line lags astern in the wake of a snivelling book otherwise he would never make a weft in his ensign for the loss of a child odds heart he could have done no more if he had sprung a topmast or started a timber the knight declaring that he would take another view of the prison in the afternoon mr felton insisted upon his doing him the honour to drink a dish of tea in his apartment and sir lancelot accepted his invitation thither they accordingly repaired after having made another circuit of the jail, and the tea-things were produced by Mrs. Felton when she was summoned to the door, and in a few minutes returning, communicated something in a whisper to her husband. He changed colour, and repaired to the staircase, where he was heard to talk aloud in an angry tone. When he came back, he told the company he had been teased by a very importunate beggar. Addressing himself to our adventurer, "'You took notice,' says he, "'of a fine lady flaunting about our walk "'in all the frippery of the fashion. "'She was lately a gay young widow "'that made a great figure at the court end of the town. "'She distinguished herself by her splendid equipage, 
her rich liveries, her brilliant assemblies, her numerous routs, and her elegant taste in dress and furniture. She is nearly related to some of the best families in England, and, it must be owned, mistress of many fine accomplishments. But being deficient in true delicacy, she endeavoured to hide that defect by affectation. She pretended to a thousand antipathies which did not belong to her nature. A breast of veal threw her into mortal agonies. If she saw a spider, she screamed, and at sight of a mouse, she fainted away. She could not, without horror, behold an entire joint of meat, and nothing but fricassees and other made dishes were seen upon her table. She caused all her floors to be lined with green bays, that she might trip along there with more ease and pleasure. Her footmen wore clogs, which were deposited in the hall, and both they and her chairmen were laid under the strongest injunctions to avoid porter and tobacco. Her jointure amounted to eight hundred pounds per annum, and she made shift to spend four times that sum. At length it was mortgaged for nearly the entire value, but, far from retrenching, she seemed to increase in extravagance, until her effects were taken in execution, and her person here deposited in safe custody. When one considers the abrupt transition she underwent, from her spacious apartments to a hovel scarce eight feet square, from sumptuous furniture to bare benches, from magnificence to meanness, from affluence to extreme poverty, one would imagine she must have been totally overwhelmed by such a sudden gush of misery. But this was not the case. She has, in fact, no delicate feelings. She forthwith accommodated herself to the exigency of her fortune. Yet she still affects to keep state amidst the miseries of a jail, and this affectation is truly ridiculous. She lies abed till two o'clock in the afternoon. She maintains a female attendant for the sole purpose of dressing her person. Her cabin is the least cleanly in the whole prison. She has learned to eat bread and cheese and drink porter, but she always appears once a day dressed in the pink of the fashion. She has found means to run in debt at the chandler's shop, the baker's and the tap-house, though there is nothing got in this place but with ready money. She has even borrowed small sums from divers prisoners who were themselves on the brink of starving. She takes pleasure in being surrounded with duns, observing that by such people a person of fashion is to be distinguished. She writes circular letters to her former friends and acquaintance, and by this method has raised pretty considerable contributions, for she writes in a most elegant and irresistible style. About a fortnight ago she received a supply of twenty guineas, when, instead of paying her little jail debts, or withdrawing any part of her apparel from pawn, she laid out the whole sum in a fashionable suit and laces, and next day borrowed of me a shilling to purchase a neck of mutton for her dinner. She seems to think her rank in life entitles her to this kind of assistance. She talks very pompously of her family and connections, by whom, however, she has been long renounced. She has no sympathy nor compassion for the distresses of her fellow creatures, but she is perfectly well-bred. She bears a repulse the best of any woman I ever knew, and her temper has never once been ruffled since her arrival at the king's bench. She now entreated me to lend her half a guinea, for which she said she had the most pressing occasion, and promised upon her honour it should be repaid to-morrow. But I lent a deaf ear to her request, and told her in plain terms that her honour was already bankrupt. Sir Lancelot, thrusting his hand mechanically into his pocket, pulled out a couple of guineas, and desired Felton to accommodate her with that trifle in his own name but he declined the proposal, and refused to touch the money. 
God forbid, said he, that I should attempt to thwart your charitable intention. But this, my good sir, is no object. She has many resources. Neither should we number the clamorous beggar among those who really feel distress. He is generally gorged with bounty misapplied. The liberal hand of charity should be extended to modest want that pines in silence, encountering cold, nakedness, and hunger, and every species of distress. Here you may find the wretch of keen sensations blasted by accident in the blossom of his fortune, shivering in the solitary recess of indigence, disdaining to beg, and even ashamed to let his misery be known. Here you may see the parent who has known happier times, surrounded by his tender offspring, naked and forlorn, demanding food, which his circumstances cannot afford. That man, of decent appearance and melancholy aspect, who lifted his hat as you passed him in the yard, is a person of unblemished character. He was a reputable tradesman in the city, and failed through inevitable losses. A commission of bankruptcy was taken out against him by his sole creditor, a Quaker, who refused to sign his certificate. He has lived three years in prison, with a wife and five small children. In a little time after his commitment, he had friends who offered to pay ten shillings in the pound of what he owed, and to give security for paying the remainder in three years by instalments. The honest Quaker did not charge the bankrupt with any dishonest practices, but he rejected the proposal with the most mortifying indifference, declaring that he did not want his money. The mother repaired to his house, and kneeling before him with her five lovely children, implored mercy with tears and exclamations. He stood this scene unmoved, and even seemed to enjoy the prospect, wearing the looks of complacency, while his heart was steeled with rancour. Woman, said he, these be hopeful babes, if they were duly nurtured. Go thy ways in peace. I have taken my resolution. Her friends maintained the family for some time but it is not in human charity to persevere. Some of them died, some of them grew unfortunate, some of them fell off, and now the poor man is reduced to the extremity of indigence, from whence he has no prospect of being retrieved. The fourth part of what you would have bestowed upon the lady would make this poor man and his family sing with joy. He had scarce pronounced these words, when our hero desired the man might be called, and in a few minutes he entered the apartment with a low obeisance. "'Mr. Colby,' said the knight, "'I have heard how cruelly you have been used by your creditor, and beg you will accept this trifling present, if it can be of any service to you in your distress.' So saying, he put five guineas into his hand poor man was so confounded at such an unlooked-for acquisition that he stood motionless and silent, unable to thank the donor. And Mr. Felton conveyed him to the door, observing that his heart was too full for utterance. But in a little time his wife, bursting into the room with her five children, looked around, and going up to Sir Lancelot without any direction, exclaimed, "'This is the angel sent by Providence!' to succour me and my poor innocence. Then, falling at his feet, she pressed his hand and bathed it with her tears. He raised her up with that complacency which was natural to his disposition. He kissed all her children, who were remarkably handsome and neatly kept, though in homely apparel, and giving her his direction, assured her she might always apply to him in her distress. After her departure, he produced a bank-note of twenty pounds, and would have deposited it in the hands of Mr. Felton, to be distributed in charities among the objects of the place. 
but he desired it might be left with Mr. Norton, who was the proper person for managing his benevolence, and he promised to assist the deputy with his advice in laying it out. End of chapter 21